Well, thank you for the opportunity to introduce uh, a new reformulation of quantum mechanics, where each quantum system is described at any time by two vectors in Hilbert space instead of one. One vector comes back, comes towards the present from a past boundary condition. Another vector comes back from the future from a future boundary condition. So I will show you how this reformulation is equivalent to the usual formulation, but it uncovers a host of new phenomena, and it leads to a new way to think about quantum mechanics, and also it suggests a, general, a very natural generalization of quantum mechanics that will solve the problem of quantum measurement. So let me start by introducing the concept of pre- and post-selection. In classical physics, if you know the state of a classical system at a given time, and you know the Hamiltonian, you can predict the future exactly, because the theory is deterministic. And therefore, a measurement in the future could not give any new insight. The answer is it's already known from the initial boundary condition. This is, of course, not the case in quantum mechanics. Because of the uncertainties of quantum mechanics, if we start with two systems that are exactly in the same initial state, they can give later, in a later measurement, different results. And therefore, we can legitimately ask the question, what is the property of a quantum system at the present if we only post-select a particular result later in the future? So let me show you how this works. Suppose this is time, and at time t1, we start with a number of particles. That all of them are described by the same state psi. This is the initial state of all, all the number of particles all of them started exactly the same initial state psi. At time t2, we make a measurement of another observable that has many different answers, and we select only those, those particles that will end up in the state phi. So this is an experiment with, where we discuss pre- and post-selected ensemble. The pre Ensemble is all the particles described by psi, by psi, and the final ensemble is all those that ended at the state psi. This is a sub part of the initial ensemble. And now we ask the question if we do a measurement in the middle, suppose in the middle we measure an observable that is described by emission operator A that has a complete set of Asian states. And we ask, what is the probability to get a particular answer in the middle with this two bounding condition? So the conventional way of describing this is the following. We say, from here to here, the system is evolved as a psi of t. Here we find the particular vector a m. So from here up to here, there will be a vector a m of t that propagates, and then we post-select, and from here further, it will be phi of c. So this is the conventional way of describing it, always just one vector, and we can calculate what is the probability to find a particular answer, a m, and the calculation goes as following. We start with psi, we evolve it in time by the time evolution operator from t1 to t, then project it on AM. This gives us an amplitude to start with Psi and get AM in the middle. Then we start with AM, propagate it to the final time, and project it on the state phi. This gives us a number CM, and CM, absolute value square, is the probability to start with Psi, get in the middle AM, and then end up in the state file. 
Up to now, there is, of course, nothing new, and it's a very straightforward calculation. Now we do a trivial mathematical change that has a very deep physical implication. I take this time evolution operator and bring it to this side by writing it u, u dagger of t to t times phi a m a m u t t1 times the initial shape side. <coughs> this gives us exactly the same answer cm. So we can certainly calculate all the properties of a quantum system in the middle by using this formulation. It's exactly equivalent. But this formulation tells us a very interesting new story because u dagger is the operator that if u is e to the minus ihc, u dagger is e to the plus ihc. That means that we take the vector phi and set it back in time. So we have now a new formulation where to calculate the properties of a quantum system in the middle, I use on equal footing the vector psi that propagates to the present from the past and the vector phi that propagates it back from the future to the same place. And you see now that I use on equal footing the two boundary condition to calculate the property of the quantum system in the intermediate time. First of all, let me mention that this is much simpler mathematical way to calculate things rather than this one. Because here, for each different answer AM, I have to solve another Schrodinger equation, another differential equation that tells me how each AM propagates in time. Here, once and for all, I calculate how phi propagates and how psi propagates, and then I get the answers by scalar products, which is much, much simpler. So already from this point of view, it's more interesting to look at the properties of quantum system by using the two vectors on equal footing. But that, of course, is not the main new achievement. By the way, this formula is called the ABL formula. It's our own of Bergman Leibovitz. That was discovered in quite early, about 50 something years ago. I was a first PhD student after my PhD, and I thought about this idea, and I was helped to develop, it, to develop it with Peter Bergman, who was an assistant of Einstein, and Joe Leibovitz, both of them were at the Shiva University when I was there at that time. This formula was resting without any attention for many years until about 25 years ago. I looked at it again and started to ask me for any question. Suppose I look at the simplest quantum system that we know, which is spin half particle. And for this spin half particle, I start with initial condition sigma x equal to plus 1. That is the condition at time t1. And I do a post selection and consider only those particles that ended up with sigma y equal to plus 1. I assume that the spin components are constant to the motion for simplicity. So now, the usual conventional way of looking at this problem is to say that between these two times, I know sigma x, and only from then on, I will know sigma y. The new picture says, no, actually, you have two information in, in the time in between. You know that both sigma x is equal to plus 1, and you also know by propagating that back in time, the sigma y is equal to plus 1. I use here a set and a bra because bra is the one that goes back in time. So I have two vectors describing here that seems to tell me more information than is usually assumed. It seems to tell me that both sigma x and sigma y are known in the time in between. How am I going to find the measurement that will show me that indeed both vectors are there, namely that both information are there. Well, one way I can, for example, measure sigma x in the middle, of course I will get sigma x equal to plus one because it's a constant of motion. If I measure sigma y in the middle, I will get either plus one or minus one. 
I'm going to discard all the cases of minus one, and then trivially, I keep only sigma y equal to plus one. But there is no big deal, because I simply discarded all the cases where it was minus one. So that's not the way to find something new. What happens if I measure sigma x plus sigma y? We I get the answer too, because if this is one and this is one, the sum is two, so maybe I should get the answer too if I measure sigma x plus sigma y in the middle. But the minute I think about it, I say, no, that is not true, because if I divide by square root of two, I know that this is a spin component in 45 degrees in the xy plane. This can be only one or minus one. It can never be square root of two. So when I looked at this, I said, oh, wait, something is wrong. I was led astray by this picture, because I saw that sigma x plus sigma y must be equal to two, and it could not be equal to two. So maybe the picture of having this two vector is wrong. But I did not give up. So I started to think, what is going on here? So then I realized the following thing, that if I try to measure in the middle here sigma x plus sigma y, I must use an inhomogeneous magnetic field in the x plus y direction that will make an uncertain precession around it so that both, it will destroy both the vector sigma x equal to plus one and the vector sigma y equal to plus one. It will rotate them by an uncertain amount. So I, the measurement that I try to do will certainly not find what I want to do because it destroys the two information. So I ask the question, can I find some measurement that will give me information without disturbing the systems? And that's how I came to the idea of something that is now called weak measurement. The idea of weak measurement is the following. It's a measurement where the measuring device interacts with the system very, very weakly. So the amount of information that I get from one system is extremely minute. But if I repeat this experiment on the same on equivalent system, many, many of them, then I can collect the information from all of them and maybe get something without the disturbance. And indeed, I find something very interesting about quantum mechanics. If you have a measurement that gives you information, epsilon, where epsilon is very small compared to one, and one is the uncertainty of the measuring device pointer, so it means that you the measuring device moves by much less than the uncertainty. So you have to repeat the experiment one over epsilon times in order to collect enough information. But the disturbance on each quantum system in this case goes at epsilon square. That means that if epsilon is very small, I can collect information on all, from all the particles without disturbing even one of them. This is very, very important, because always we think in quantum mechanics that measurement that gives you information necessarily must also give disturbance. And this is not the case if you have an ensemble of particles. Let me show it to you by an example. Suppose somebody prepares n spin particles, non-interacting, all of them in the same direction. The spin of all of them is in the same direction. And it gives me the challenge to find out in which direction the spins were prepared. Now, of course, if I have only one particle, I can never find the direction because the straight in one direction and the straight in one in another direction are not orthogonal. So there is no way to find the direction of a single spin. But if I have sufficient number of them, then I take the the whole ensemble in this direction and the whole ensemble in another direction, the scalar product of the vector for the whole ensemble goes as cosine theta to the power n. So if n is sufficiently large, the, the two ensembles are orthogonal to each other, and therefore if you have a large enough particle, in principle you can find the direction. The question is now, how will you do it in the laboratory? The conventional way of doing it was to say the following. I will take a particular large subgroup measuring all of them sigma x. 
from, I will get some times plus one, some times minus one. From this, I will be able to calculate the average of sigma x. Then I will take another subgroup and find the average of sigma y, etc. So I pay the penalty that I have to disturb many of the particles to corrupt them in order to find out the direction. But now I want to show you there is another way to do it, which doesn't disturb even a single particle, no collapse at all, and still find the direction of the spins. And the trick is the following. If you look at the operator of the sum of sigma xn divided by n, well, these are spins of individual particles. The sum divided by n is an operator for the whole ensemble. And because this operator commutator with the operator of sigma yn divided by n, the commutator of this is the sum of sigma zn times i divided by n squared. The sum of sigma zn at most is equal to n, and therefore, the two things commute with each other, and you can measure all of them without any disturbance. So we have now a new way to make measurement of quantum systems, measurement that don't cause any collapse at all, and find all the information of individual quantum systems without disturbing any of them. This is a very important point. Now, the question is, can I use that kind of method to make a measurement of sigma x plus sigma y and show that the answer will be true? And the answer is yes. So in fact, I want to prove now that if I have a pointer that is described by coordinate q and pq, and I write the coupling e to the i epsilon q times p, q times some operator a. So q is the coordinate of a measuring device. A is the coordinate of, is the observer of the system. And I ask what happens if I do such a transformation on the system and the measuring device together. If epsilon is a large number, that will shift the measuring device, the PQ, this is the translation operator in, on PQ, it will shift it by one of the eigenvalues. That is a strong measurement. But suppose epsilon is very small. What happens now if I apply this, this thing to the vector of the system times the vector of the measuring device? And let's call it, this is the initial state of the system, and I project it now on a final state of the system. I ask now, what will happen to the measuring device if I start with psi 1 for the system, do this weak measurement, and then post select psi 2? Now, because epsilon is very small, I can write it as psi 1 times 1 plus i epsilon q times a times psi 2, uh, sorry, psi 2 times psi 1 and let it act on phi. And I neglect things of the order of epsilon square. So I can write, if I look at that thing here, I can write it as psi 2 times psi 1 multiplied by 1 plus i epsilon psi 2 psi 2 a psi 1 divided by psi 2 psi 1 and multiplied by q. And I will say something very interesting. The shift of the measuring device when I do a very weak measurement is not by one of the eigenvalues, it's not by the average, it's by this new, new observable new result, new uh, value, which I call weak value. So I define weak value, a weak value of an observer A, given that I did a pre-selection with psi 1 
and proxy action with Psi2, then I get a, an answer in the measuring device. The measuring device is shifted by Psi2 A times Psi1 divided by Psi2 Psi1. And this I call the weak value of A. So a weak value of an observable is if I do a pre-selection on Psi1, do a very weak measurement, very weak coupling of A, then the measuring device will be shifted. This is a shift operator. I can exponent it again and write it as e to the i epsilon q times A weak. And I see, therefore, that when I do a weak measurement, the pointer of the measuring device will move very little but it will move by a new value, which is called the weak value. So the weak value, if I put here sigma x1 equal to 1, I put here sigma y1 equal to 1, the weak value of A will indeed be equal to 2. So if I have an ensemble of particles that all of them started with psi, and I make on each one of them a measurement, a very weak measurement of sigma x plus sigma y, and then post-select and collect only the cases where I get sigma y equal to plus 1 at the end, then I look at the shift of the measuring device pointers, all of those pointers that were pre- and post-selected to, to interact with this condition, then the average of this pointer will shift by a new amount, which is called the weak value. So the weak value now is a new property of quantum system, any observable of a quantum system, if you do a pre and post selection of this quantum system, you get an answer by collecting the pre and post selected ensemble, which is equal to the weak value. Now, this weak value has many interesting properties, apart from the fact that it can be two outside the, the user range. It has two amazing properties. One, that if psi 2 and psi 1 are nearly orthogonal to each other, this weak value can be very, very large. It can be much, much larger than the maximum value. And this is now being used in many, many laboratories in the world to see very small effects. And the way that it is done experimentally now in many laboratories is to, for example, take a laser beam with many, many photons, all of them started with polarization in one direction. Then you let, let this laser beam interact very weakly with some system. And after it interacted with the system, you post-select only those photons of the laser that came out with a polarization nearly orthogonal to the original polarization. That means that out of the ensemble, you post-select a very small fraction of it. But this small fraction you see, has been shifted by much, much bigger amount than the amount that will get if you do, do, don't do the post-selection. So this allows you now to do very, very experiment to see very, very small effects. For example, in Rochester, they did the following. They took a laser beam and they interacted with a system that shifted the direction of the laser beam, but such a small amount that they say that if we would send this laser beam to the moon, on the moon, the shift, is, the shift will be just by one hair, so small. There was no hope to see this in, in usual techniques. But by doing the right print post selection, they were able to show that indeed that was the, the shift of the direction. There are now experiments that are done in biology and chemistry and quantum optics that use this kind of amplification. So this is one important uh, new result of this approach. But there are many more interesting new things that I don't have much time to say, but let me tell you a few, few examples of how exciting this area is. Oh, and but before I have to tell you what does it mean to get a complex number, after we always think that a number in measuring device, in, measuring, in a measurement must always be real, but that's not the case in quantum mechanics. Because in quantum mechanics, if I have a wave function, Psi of P. So suppose this is the, or Psi, say, Psi of Q. Suppose this is the wave function, the Q representation for a pointer. And suppose I want to find out, does it have a meaning to say that the pointer has been shifted 
by an imaginary number? The answer is yes in quantum mechanics, because suppose this is a Gaussian. So you look at e to the minus q plus iq0 square over delta square, and you see that this iq0 doesn't shift the position, but in fact it shifts the momentum. Because you write it at e to the i minus q square, and then the cost term is q times iq0. e to the q iq q0 over delta square, this is a shift in the momentum rather than a shift in the position. So in quantum mechanics, there is a meaning to say that you have measured something that gives you a complex value. The real part of the complex value is a shift of the pointer, and the imaginary part is a shift of the complementary, the conjugate variable of the pointer. OK, I want to show you a number of very exciting, fascinating new properties. This is a very huge subject, so I have I practically no time to tell you most of the interesting things. But I will tell you two or three very fascinating examples of, of the new insight that you get from this formalism. The first one is the following. Suppose you have two three cavities, and you start the initial part in the state psi 1 plus psi 2 plus psi 3 divided by square root of 3. That means that the party has one third probability to be in each one of the boxes. And then later time, you post-select and the state psi 1 plus psi 2 minus psi 3. OK? The two things are not orthogonal, so you can post-select it. And now you find something very exciting. Suppose you say that in the middle time, I would have looked whether the path is in this box. I would certainly have to find it there. Because if I did not find it there, the state here would be psi 1 psi 2 plus psi 3. The state here is psi 2 minus psi 3. So these two are orthogonal. So therefore, I must find the particle here. But if instead I would have opened this box, I must find the particle there. There is one particle. And I know that for sure I will find it in one box if I open it. Or instead, if I open the other box, I will find it there. What happens if I look at the third box? I, look, I find that the weak value of the projection operator in the third box is minus 1. The question is, what does it mean? Some people want to say, to say this is a negative probability. I think this is stupid, because probability has to do with counting. You can never count a negative number. But what you can do is the following. You say, if I suppose the particle is charged, in order to measure weakly whether the particle is zero or not, I can measure the electric field outside. And I would find, if I do the experiment many, many times, that the average electric field outside if I do a print post-selection, it's in the opposite direction. The same with gravitational field. So that means that if I find a weak value for the projection operator, which is negative, it means that the system will behave as if there is a particle there with all the opposite properties of ordinary particles. It's not, it's not like electron positron because the positron has positive mass. This particle will also have behave like it has negative mass, it will give an opposite gravitational field. So this is one exciting new idea. The other one is something that I have named the quantum Cheshire set effect. How many of you read Alice in Wonderland? Raise your hand. Most of you. All of those that did not read, read you must read it because it, it's an amazing book. So anyhow, in this Alice in Wonderland, Alice is wandering in this uh, beautiful garden, and she can talk to all the animals there. She meets a cat. The cat is from Cheshire, which is uh, some village in England. That's why it's called Cheshire cat. So she talks to this cat, and the cat finally gets mad at her and decides to disappear. But it disappears in a very funny way. First the tail, then the body. Then the face, and the only thing that is left is the smile of the cat. So Alice tells tell the cat, I many times see the cat without a smile, but what does it mean to see a smile without a cat? OK? So uh, anybody that reads this book, including me, when I read it, said, OK, this guy is crazy, he speaks about something that could never happen. Well, quantum mechanics showed me how it does happen. So I will not do it with a cat and a smile, but I will do it 
with a partisan spin. I will show that it's possible to take, for example, a neutron and arrange it in such a way that the neutron, the mass of the neutron, will move one side and its spin will leave it, will leave it and move on the other side by itself. So let, let me show you this experiment now has been done in a number of laboratories. So let's see, let's see how it works. Suppose again, again I have just two cavities, and every particle will spin up, and the initial state is the particle in the state left plus right times sigma is equal to plus one. So the particle in, has sigma is equal to plus one, and it's a linear combination of being here and here with equal probability. This is a pre-selection. The post-selection is left times sigma is equal to plus one, plus right times sigma is equal to minus one. So you can immediately see that with this post-selection, I can never find the particle here. Because the fi to find the particle here, I have to sum up the probability to find the particle with sigma is equal to plus one, and sigma is equal to minus one, I get zero. So I know that for sure the particle is here. On the other hand, if I look at the spin sigma x, I find that in fact the spin sigma x is in this box. And you can do now experiments where you say that experiment has been done. You take, you take, for example, two neutrons next to each other, and uh, you render that they are in this spin post direction, and then you can show that on the right side you have magnetic moment moving, and on the right si left side you have mass moving, and you have managed to separate the spin from the neutron. So this shows you how you can separate a smile from a shape. In fact, the principle is now that you can show that it's possible to take any quantum system that is defined, the location of it is defined by properties that must be there, like mass and charge. But if the particle has more than one possible state, like spin, can be up or down, or if you take, for example, a hydrogen atom, it could be in different excited states, you can separate the internal energy from the mass. The proton and the electron will be on one side, and the energy of the atom will be on the other side. And we are going to publish now a new article which is nearly completed, where we show that this can happen. We can arrange channels, quantum channels, where we leave the particle here and what's moving in the channel, some property of it, and then it's being absorbed far away without the mass ever traveling there. So people sometimes speak about it as being counterfactual experiment in which without the particle moving from one side to other, you can affect the other side. But the right way to think about it is by using in this language that you separate the properties of the particle from the particle itself. Last example, before I will say some very few words about other achievements, is the thing that I named the prison hall effect. Prison hall, you know, prison are, you know, this uh, animal, okay? Mathematician discovered an extremely deep theorem that they've called pigeonhole theorem. The theorem says that if you have two holes and three pigeons, in one hole there must be two pigeons, right? If the number of pigeons is bigger than the number of holes, there must be some holes in which there is more than one pigeon. Unbelievably deep theorem, okay? Now, but it was given this name. So, now we show that this is not true quantum mechanics. In fact, we can have and this is going to be very important for a new kind of entanglement. We can have three particles and two cavities, and we can show that no two particles, and the two, three particles are in the two cavities, and nevertheless, no two particles are in the same cavity. Uh, this has been published last year in, proceeding in the PNAS, Proceeding National Academy of Science, and by the way, it was chosen to be the most interesting article in science published in PNAS. So if you look in PNAS, you will see the detail of this experiment. But let me just say, tell you why it is connected with entanglement, 
Well, this is the subject of this, this, uh, this uh, conference. In the user ensemble, you have two particles that must interact in the beginning, then they separate to each, uh, each other, they are now entangled, so we can find the entanglement by making of the ensemble measurement here and measurement here, and check by local experiment that the two systems are entangled. Now, in this new case, we have an opposite situation. We can show that we can have two particles on which we do only local experiment. But we do pre and post selection local experiment. We never had the, in, let the particles interact with each other. And nevertheless, we can show in the time in between, they are completely entangled. But in order to check it, you have to bring them together and let them interact. So this is a dual situation to the usual entanglement. The usual entanglement you prepare by interaction and you check by local measurement. Here, you do local measurement on the system and in order to check that they are entangled, you have to bring them together. But this new kind of entanglement doesn't satisfy the mo monogamy. You can have n particles and you can show that each pair of them is entangled in this way so that you can test it and see that indeed for this new kind of entanglement, the monogamy does not work. This is very important work for people that are interested in entanglement. I encourage you to read this article that's called The Quantum Prison Hall Effect. It was in PNAS uh, last year sometime. Okay, now let me tell you just in words what other achievements are of this new reformulation. First of all, we can solve the measurement problem by assuming the following thing. What does quantum mechanics tell you if you just follow it blindly? It tells you that if you do a measurement in which you amplify a microscopic system to go one way or another way depending on the state of the microscopic system, the manual idea, which is the one that follows blindly what the mathematics says, says that indeed both things happen. Although when we come, for example, we do a stranger experiment, there will be one spot on the photographic plate if the spin is up, another spot on the photographic plate if the spin is down. We come and look at it, we'll see only one spot, right? Never two spots, never. But quantum mechanics tells you, if you believe out the mathematics, in fact, you also are now in two states. One state of your memory remembers that you saw this spot, another state of you remember that you saw the other spot. Both of them exist in our world, although one of you are, is not aware of the other. This is the manual idea. I think it's crazy because it tells you that many, very quickly the whole macroscopic world becomes completely quantum mechanical because that's because there was one miserable quantum system that was in two states. All macroscopic world becomes now why? Because it has all these many branches. So we should better try to avoid it. And the way to avoid it is by using boundary conditions on the universe. Up to now, we said that we do the pre and post reaction. But now, suppose I assume that for macroscopic systems that go into two possible macroscopic states that, according to quantum mechanics, are both existing in the universe, then suppose we have a boundary condition in the future for the universe that tells you that only one of them is selected. So by this vector coming back in, in time, you can actually avoid the whole problem of this terrible idea of having many, many me being at the same time here and, and uh, maybe in the United States because I made before a decision of quantum mechanics to go to other place. I want to avoid it. And there is a way to do it. And we showed it by an article, there are some subtleties, but it's a new way to solve the measuring problem or the idea how to go to classes of world by having two bounding conditions for the universe. Now, the last thing I want to show you is a very original solution to the famous or infamous two slit experiment. What is the paradox? You know, I met Feynman once, and Feynman told me that uh, for him, the only paradox in quantum mechanics is the two-slit. If you were able to understand that, he said, 
all the quantum mechanics will be clear. But he said nobody will ever understand it. He writes it also in his book. So let me show you how it's possible to understand the two suite in a new way. So first of all, I claim that in quantum, when quantum mechanics started, it started in two different ways. One by Heisenberg and the other by Schrodinger. Heisenberg came a few months earlier, and he had this formalism that uses matrices. He did not know what matrices are. Bowen told him what they are, but anyhow, he used matrices. And he was able to solve the harmonic oscillator of the hydrogen atom, but the minute when they tried to solve he and the other people tried to solve more complicated systems, they, they found it extremely difficult. Then came Schrodinger. And Schrodinger used an idea of the Broglie that, he, that it's unbelievable that people did not realize how wrong this idea was. What did the Broglie say? The Broglie said, look, I have a classical system which is a wave. I find that quantum mechanics tells me also that this wave has particle properties. Uh -huh. So particle, pro particle must have also wave property. That's what the boy said. There was this article, Einstein gave it a lot of praise. Many people praised it. Schrodinger saw it and wrote his famous equation for wave equation. But this is wrong from the beginning because in electromagnetic theory, wave properties are electric and magnetic fields. They are complementary to the number of photons. You can never say that a single photon has definite electric and magnetic field because the two things don't commute. In fact, the electric and magnetic field, which are the wave properties, they are collected properties of many, many uncertain number of photons. This it's the wrong idea to say that I connect a wave property with a single photon. This is not true. So therefore, the same, in the same token, we must realize that the wave properties, so-called wave properties of electrons, are only properties of ensemble. We can never associate a wave property to a single electron. You try to think about it. A single electron, if it's described by a wave, what does it mean? Where is its mass and charge? Is it spread? No, it's always found at one place. So what does it mean to speak about the whole wave? You can only give it a meaning of probability, namely the property of ensemble. OK? So, but then people say, aha. But suppose you look at the two theta experiment. You send one electron after the other. Then we see that each electron knows that the two seats are open. Because if one seat was closed, the, there are places where the photographic page, the electron could appear. But if the two of them are open, it will never appear there. That means that each electron must know that the two seats are open. The only way to explain this is say that it's also a wave, the single electron, that goes through both seats. Now, let me tell you an interesting historical story. In, in, in 1962, I came to visit Mark, Mark Planck Institute in Munich. And people, the assistant of uh, Heisenberg, by the name of Peter Drew, met me and said, I would like you to meet Heisenberg. He brought me to Heisenberg's room and asked Professor Heisenberg, can you tell me how do you understand the two fleet experiment in your language? And I was very surprised to find out that they didn't know how to do it. So I showed him how to do it, like I will show you in a minute. He was so excited about it that from this time till the end of his life, Peter do, do told me that every visitor that will come to him will really show to him how you can explain the two fleet experiment by using the Heisenberg formalism. And in this way, he felt vindicated. Because he was all the time saying that although what Schrodinger did was very nice mathematical uh, treatment, but it, it, it misses all what he knew in quantum mechanics. And he was right. So I, let me tell you now what is really new in quantum mechanics. And people did not realize it. If you look at the Heisenberg equation of motion, dynamic, the dynamics of quantum mechanics, it replaces its proton bracket by commutator. Usually people think that the, the, the difference is very minute, only correction to the order of eight bar. That was the Rako template. But this is not true. It turned out 
that for the relevant two-seat experiment, the relevant variables or emission operators that are sensitive to the two-seat are things that are mod like modular momentum. I will show you to, do I have another five minutes of that then? You have five. I have five minutes, okay. So I will show you how it's possible to explain how each electron knows that the other slit is open, even though it goes only through one slit, is because it has properties that are some emission observables that the equation of motion is non-local. And because it's non-local, its behavior depends on a slit being open or not, where it is not. Now, people say immediately, but in that case, you will violate causality immediately because if the electron is here and it has some property here that knows whether the other slit is open or not, you can violate causality. You close, you close there immediately. This, this property has to change. So quantum mechanics saved the day by, by showing that in this case, that property is completely uncertain. And only by doing pre and post selection you can actually show that I can do an interference experiment by making weak measurement on the whole ensemble seeing the interference pattern. Then afterwards, I can do another experiment that will tell me so we treat each part as it went. And then I can really show that the difference between the Heisenberg and, and classic, the Heisenberg equation of motion, the classic equation of motion, is the quantum mechanics, the dynamics is non-local. And because of that, we can explain what's happening to this experiment, not by saying that the particle is wave, but by saying that the particle has properties, the things on it, but the equation of motion depends non-locally whether the other field is open or not. I did it much too fast. I recommend, if you are interested in all of this, there is a book that I've written in collaboration with Daniel Rolich that's called Quantum Paradoxes. Some of these things are described there. The other things are going to be described by things coming back from the future, another session edition will come in another year or so. Thank you. <laughs>